In this video, I want to discuss one incredibly important aspect of the listening process, and that is responses and feedback. How do we respond and provide feedback effectively as listeners? Well, as you may recall, as part of the listening process, we went through the listening process stages, responding is a really important part. It's that last final stage there in the listening process. So we have an obligation to respond not only because it demonstrates that we're, that we're actually listening, that you know, gives that outward indication that we're listening, uh, but also helps us process things more effectively and, and do a better job as listeners. So all kinds of reasons we want to respond. So we're going to talk about how we can do that effectively. There are really eight different types of listening responses that we're going to discuss here, and we're going to take each of these individually, but you can see them here. Silence and silent listening, questioning, paraphrasing, empathizing, supporting, analyzing, evaluating, and advising. So let's break down each of these individually just briefly here. First of all, silence is sometimes an appropriate response as a listener. Uh, as you may notice here in this, this saying, that the word listen contains the same letters as the word silent. Is that a coincidence? Possibly, I don't know. English is a weird language, but but if so, I mean, you know, it's a really important connection there. I think between silence and listening. Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all. Uh, it's appropriate in a variety of situations. Uh, silence could be, you know, if you're, you know, sometimes it's best to be silent if you don't have anything nice to say. As your mom told you over and over again, right? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Sometimes if you don't have anything nice to say, you should just be silent. Sometimes you need to be silent, though, because the other person doesn't need you to say anything. They just need to get it off their chest in a cathartic way or whatever. It doesn't really respond. It doesn't really require you to respond in any way. So just listening silently can be best, too. So there, I mean, there are a variety of situations in which silence would be appropriate. We also use silence so that we can be present and attentive. It allows us to just be present and attentive, not have to worry about what we're going to say in response or do anything like that. But, but silence also it gives it... The, specific indication that we are we are present, we are attentive, we're not trying to interrupt, we're not trying to overtake the, the conversation, not trying to tell them what's right or wrong or anything like that. We're just listening. We can use nonverbal cues, even when we're silent, we can use nonverbal cues to indicate that we are listening. We can maintain eye contact, we can kind of lean in, we can arch our eyebrows, we can smile or frown, we can use facial expressions, we can do all kinds of things nonverbally to indicate that we're listening even with silence. And there are also some things that we can do through verbal back channeling, by which we mean saying things like, mm hmm, mm hmm, yes, go on, mm hmm. Not really extensive uh, responses, but, uh, you know, use verbal back, sorry, back channeling in con conjunction with silence to kind of, you know, get, indicate that we're listening and to, to prompt that person to, to go on and continue that. We can also use questioning as a response. It's, it can be a very effective response. So, really, I mean, questioning is exactly what it sounds like. It's asking questions in order to gain more information. When we use questioning, though, we want to be sure that we're using uh, authentic questions and not using disingenuous questions, right? We want to use genuine questions that, that, that are actually intended to get somewhere, as opposed to disingenuous questions, which are, are really just distractions and not really connected to what the person is talking about. So, for example, Authentic questions. We use authentic questions to clarify meanings. We use it to learn about the other's thoughts, feelings, and wants. When we ask these kind of legitimate, genuine questions, uh, these questions encourage elaboration. They encourage discovery. And they gather more facts and details. These are good questions to ask when they're accomplishing these types of things. These are effective uses of questions as a listener. However, disingenuous questions are questions that more lead or trap the speaker that they make statements instead of really asking questions. You know, things like, you don't really believe that, do you? I mean, technically that's a question, but it's really more of a statement. Like, you got to be nuts if you, if you believe this, right? They also carry hidden agendas sometimes. If we ask questions in a certain way, they seek correct answers, quote-unquote correct answers, meaning meaning that, that you know, it's not really an open-ended question. You're really leading that person and, and looking for that correct answer. You're leading them toward that correct answer. Uh, and they're based on assumptions. These are, these are not good questions to ask when they when they accomplish these things. We want to focus on genuine questions, authentic questions, uh, that help further that conversation and, and accomplish those things as opposed to these disingenuous questions. Okay, so questions are very very effective as a listening response in the proper context and given the nature of those questions, if they're authentic versus disingenuous. 
We can also use paraphrasing, which is restating what you think the speaker said using your own words. And that's an important uh, caveat there. When using your own words, we're not just repeating exactly what they said. We're restating it. We're, we're reframing things in, uh, you know, in our own words uh, to indicate uh, what we think that person said and to clarify, make sure we have uh, appropriate understanding. So some things to keep in mind when we're paraphrasing. First of all, again, we've got to change the speaker's wording. Otherwise, we're just doing what we call parroting, like the bird, the parrot, right? The parrots don't really understand what they're saying, but sometimes they can repeat back certain phrases. As a, as a listener, you don't just want to repeat back these, these phrases and those words, because that doesn't indicate any kind of listening or understanding. It just indicates that you can repeat exactly what they said. So we want to restate things. We want to change the wording around and paraphrasing to indicate that we have an understanding or to check that understanding, right? Sometimes we paraphrase when we, when we say, let me see if I have this correct. And then we change things around a little bit to make sure that we have a clear understanding. But either way, we need to change the speaker's wording intro and we restate it in our own words. We can also, in paraphrasing, offer an example. You know, so for example, is this what you're getting at? And, you know, reframe it in that type of situation to make sure that, again, we're on the same page. We have the same understanding of what that person is, is saying and what they're going for there. And we can use paraphrasing to reflect on the underlying theme, right? The, again, we don't have to restate things exactly, but by reframing it, restating things in our own words, we can kind of get to the core of, here's what I hear you saying. Here's what, I, here's what I'm understanding you say. So when we're paraphrasing, we want to be sure that we're using it uh, for those, those uh, purposes and doing it in that way. Another listening response is empathizing. Empathizing, which are perspective-taking responses that demonstrate identification with the speaker, indicating that, that we can see things through their eyes. We can kind of, uh, when we identify with someone, we can uh, kind of understand where they're coming from. So empathizing is perspective taking uh, that demonstrates an identification with the speaker. So some things to keep in mind here. First of all, you need to be genuine. If you're going to empathize, if you're going to say, I understand, I can see how that would be frustrating, then, then you, he, that needs to be a genuine response. You can't just be picking this stuff up. If you don't see where they're coming from or you, you don't uh, take their perspective, you can't take their perspective, then you shouldn't be saying you can't. Empathizing needs to be genuine. Empathizing could be brief or it could be extended, right? Sometimes we empathize by saying, yeah, I understand, I get it, I feel I feel it, or something like that. Just a couple of words, right, to indicate that we understand, that we know where they're coming from. Other times we could say, yes, I understand, I've, I've been there, and this is, you know, this, this is what happened to me, if you think that's appropriate. Again, we don't want to overtake the conversation, but you can you can kind of disclose a little bit in terms of empathizing and, and uh, share in a little more extended way. So it can be either brief or extended. Either one can be effective. Uh, you want to avoid some of these non-empathic behaviors, some specific things you want to avoid. We're talking here about things like denying that person the right to their feelings, indicating that they don't have the right or the, the uh, you know, that they have, they're wrong in feeling this way. Don't want to do that. You don't want to minimize the significance of this moment. It may not seem like a huge deal to you, but uh, you know, I, I was having a conversation one time, a long time ago, with a with a mentor and, and supervisor that I had about. I'd been talking with some junior high kids about you know how their relationships, and they said, "Well, I broke up my boyfriend, and they'd been dating for like a week, and she was just devastated or whatever." And I was you know, kind of joking about this with my boss, and he said, "You know, puppy love is real to puppies," and that just blew me away. I mean, it may, to me, seem like, you've only been dating this guy for a little long, you've got a long life to live here. But for her, that was the world. That was her whole world. And so I shouldn't have minimized the significance of that to her, right, in her mind. So we don't want to do that when we're empathizing. We want to avoid blame. You know, don't just want to say, well, obviously that was your fault, or no, it's not my fault, and don't point your finger at me or whatever. That's not an empathetic behavior. Get out of that blame game uh, notion and headspace. And we don't want to rain on their parade. Either with good news or bad news. You know, if they're feeling bad, sometimes we just need to let them feel sorry about something. Or if they're feeling good, we need to let them feel good about that. You know, even if it's a small thing, we, we shouldn't say, well, that doesn't seem like that big a deal. Right? Those are those are non-empathic behaviors. So we want to avoid all those types of things. Another type of listening response we can use is supporting. These are responses that demonstrate support for the speaker's situation. We're going to give them a hand. We're going to help them up here, right? We're going to do something for them. So some different types of supporting responses, specific supporting responses include agreement. We can agree with that person. We can offer to help that person. We can offer praise to that person and congratulate them and lift them up in that way. 
we can provide them with reassurance. Things are going to be okay. Things, you know, we're going to be able to move forward here. You're going to be fine. And we can divert them. We can offer them some sort of diversion. You know, if you, I know you're feeling bad, but so let's go do something to take your mind off of things here, right? We can offer these types of supporting responses as a, as a listening response. Analyzing is also a listening response that we can use at times. These are responses that offer an interpretation of the speaker's message in order to help them see alternative meanings of a situation, right? to help them gain some new perspective and see things maybe in a different light. So some tips for analyzing responses, though. We want to be sure, first of all, that we offer it in a tentative way. That we're that we're not you know we're, we're not the end all be all here that we're offering it in a you know kind of tentative way first of all to make sure that they're that they're interested in hearing your your response but also because we don't have all the answers here so uh, and we don't want to minimize their own perspective but we want to offer some different perspectives in a tentative way we also need to be sure that we're reasonably correct or we should be silent I don't offer some you know different perspectives if you're not confident in those perspectives, if you really don't know what you're talking about, then it's probably best to, to go with response number one and just be silent. And also, again, we want to make sure that our response, or that our analysis sorry, is wanted. Uh, you, don't want, you don't want to offer these things. If that Maybe they're just looking to blow off some steam, and they're not looking for somebody to say, well, have you considered it from this perspective, or have you thought about it in this way? Maybe they just want to blow off some steam. And so we need to make sure, first of all, that, that they want us to provide that kind of response at all. We could take this a step further and get into evaluating as well. These are responses that evaluate the speaker's thoughts in a favorable or unfavorable way. So here we're offering, you know, yes, that was you're right or you're wrong, or, that's good or that's bad or so forth. Right? We're offering some sort of judgment or evaluation here. So again, some tips for evaluating responses. First, can first and foremost, make sure that your evaluation is wanted. They may not be interested in this, and if you offer it and it's not wanted, then it could put somebody in a defensive space. So make sure that your evaluation is wanted, first and foremost. Uh, secondly, be sincere with your evaluation. Be sincere. Offer them your sincere thoughts uh, and do it in kind of gentle way. I mean, you don't have to be mean about these things, but be sincere, be truthful, and be honest with these things. And then finally, be constructive. Don't just tear somebody down, even if even if you think they did the wrong thing or, you know, whatever, but be constructive. You know, I would have done this a different way, and here's how and here's why. Be constructive with your uh, criticism. Finally, we have advising as a uh, as a listening response, and these are responses that offer the speaker a resolution to their problem or situation. Here, we're trying to help them fix things. We're offering some input that we think would allow them to fix this situation. So, some things to keep in mind on when to advise. Uh, first of all, you can advise when the speaker asks for advice. Uh, that's always a good indication that you're safe to give advice because, again, not everybody wants your advice. But when they ask for it, that's a pretty good indication. So, so feel free to do that when they ask for it. When they're willing to listen, be sure that they're in the right mental space to listen and to, to process that advice and that information and make use of it. So, you know, if they're in the throes of a fit, then that may not be the best time to advise them because they may not be willing to listen at that point. When you're confident in the advice that's being given, again, if you're not confident, if you don't really know what you're talking about, then you should prob probably be silent. But when you're confident, then, then feel free to issue that advice. And when you won't face blowback if it doesn't work, you give advice and, and it doesn't work, which happens. I mean, you know, not all advice is, is, is guaranteed, but, uh, but when there's significant uh, possibilities that that, that blowback is going to get back and, and do harm to you or to that relationship, then you may want to consider whether or not uh, that's an effective listening response. So shifting gears here just a little bit from the listening responses to providing form, formal feedback, and then we're going to talk about feedback to yourself as well, but uh, so shifting gears to feedback a little bit, uh, there's some keys to keep in mind for giving formal feedback when you're giving it to others. So you're giving it, we're talking here about like an employee evaluation and things like that. You want to be specific. Don't just say, well, you're not doing a very good job. Say specifically what they're doing right or what they're doing wrong and, and give specific examples. Be descriptive, not evaluative. You're just not a very good employee. Well, why is that? Be descriptive. Talk about what it is they're doing. Again, giving specific examples. Be positive as much as possible. You want to, you want to build somebody up through these things too. Be constructive. Again, give them things that they can use. Uh, be realistic. Um, don't say, well, I need you to cut your process time on this in half. That may not be realistic, right? So be realistic with these people. Give them some realistic goals. And be relevant. Keep it focused on the job and focused on the, the tasks at hand. 
When you're giving feedback to yourself, you want to be sure to identify strengths and weaknesses. Evaluate the task guidelines that, that you're using. Uh, set some goals for the next time so you can do better. And revisit those goals and assess your progress. If you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm always happy to talk about listening or any other topics.